Hello, this is me, Erika Stahl von Holstein. And this is Luca de Biase. Welcome to Reimagine Talks, the podcast to challenge the way we think. Today we're here to reimagine democracy with Sir Jeff Mulgan. Sir Jeff Mulgan is Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation at University College London. Prior to that, he was Chief Executive of NESTA, the UK Innovation Foundation, between 2011 and the end of 19. Previously, he was uh, uh, in the government, the UK government, including Director of the Government Strategy Unit and Performance and Innovation Unit, and Head of Policy in the Prime Minister's Office. He has also been uh, first chief executive of the Young Foundation. He was the first director of the Think Tank Demos, and he has been a reporter on BBC TV and radio. His latest books include Big Mind, How Collective Intelligence Can Change Our World, Social Innovation, How Societies Find the Power to Change, Another World is Possible, how to reignite social and political imagination when science meets power. His books have been translated into many languages, including Chinese, Arabic, Korean, and many more. Well, thank you, Jeff, for being here today with us to reimagine democracy and collective intelligence. Having been at the heart of this debate for so long and having thought about so many different dimensions of this uh, topic, how would you define democracy in this context and why do you think it's so important to reimagine it? Well, thank you, Erica and Luca. In a way, democracy at heart is very simple and it's in the word which comes from ancient Greek. It means ruled by the people. But that can mean many things. The question is, how do the people collectively make decisions which serve their interests? And I think three sort of angles on democracy are essential and often missed out when we discuss it. The first is to realize that in reality, democracy is not a single thing. It's not just about elections and not just about presidents or parliaments. It's always been an assembly of multiple elements, including uh, regular elections and multiple tiers and political parties and programs, but also constitutions, supreme courts and so on. And it's the assembly which makes it work. If it was only everything being voted for, we'd probably have pretty disastrous results for democracy. So it's the assembly which makes it work, just as most of the technologies we depend on, like the car or the laptop, are actually assemblies of multiple elements pulled together to become useful. So that's point one, which is often forgotten because people just think of democracy as only about voting. And voting is very important, but it's not uh, all that democracy is. Secondly, nearly all the forms we have in democracy were essentially crystallized in the 19th century. Uh, ancient Greece obviously had very different models of, of direct democracy, though not for women and slaves. But in the 19th century, we got the model we take for granted now, which is that every four or five years, you vote for a political party which has a program, you send people to an assembly in the capital city, they pass laws, and you get to decide a few years later whether to keep them or kick them out. Now, what's so odd about that is that model has hardly changed. In 2024, we're still essentially using that 19th century model of democracy even though almost every other field of our lives has been transformed, how we work, how we shop, how we do relationships, how we travel, how we do finance, have been transformed by using technologies to reimagine uh, how these functions are done. And I think, and this is the crucial perhaps third point, as a result, democracy often feels now out of kilter with the rest of the world. People don't feel it expresses their interests, their views enough. People don't see it making use of all the intelligence there is around in their society to make really good decisions. And so we have this strange feeling that collective stupidity is as, as common as collective intelligence, that our democracy uh, has lost trust. And according to the surveys, each generation has had less trust in democracy as a system. And I think part of the reason is the failure to reimagine democracy. Well, Jeff, at Reimagine Europe, uh, we often reference Don Quixote to illustrate how 
today's society expends much energy tinting at will means rather than confronting real societal issues. Do you agree with this metaphor? And in your view, how does the current framework of public debate hinder the emergence of uh, innovative ideas and solutions? Well, I think there are many barriers to, to change and reform. The most obvious one is that the people who are beneficiaries of the system as it is now are unlikely to be the ones who will want to completely transform it. And globally, most of the new ideas, the pressures for reinvention, reimagining of democracy have come from outsiders, from new political parties or new political movements trying to challenge the incumbents. But usually the incumbents have said, actually, we think the system, you know, basically works. Let's, let's not, uh, not, not uh, mess around with it. I think with the added crucial issue now and in the last 10 or 15 years of really the, the hinterland around democracy of social media and misinformation and fake news and deep fakes and all of these things, we've had a, a whole world of technology transforming the information, which is vital for, for democracy to thrive. But more and more, it's not actually serving democracy well because it is circulating falsehoods. It is amplifying the most extreme emotions. It's contributing to polarization and not to problem solving. And in a way, I think we had a missed chance 20 or 30 years ago as the internet was becoming so much part of our, our daily life that far too little work was done to ensure we use this incredible resource to enhance our capacity to make decisions together. This was what this is why I became obsessed with collective intelligence and the many and many uses of technology which try to help us collectively make better decisions. But most of the money <laughs> went on the algorithms in YouTube and Facebook and so on, which actually went in the, exactly the opposite direction, spreading the very things which make it harder to make wise decisions uh, collectively. And we have to we have to put that right now. And um, I mean, this is really interesting. And I think in particular, we, we explored this when we had our podcast with uh, Manuel Castells on you know, what we call the paradox of our time to some extent, because on the one hand, all these technologies that you have been referencing and all this have really changed the world we live in. So we're facing unprecedented challenges to some extent. We then have climate change on top of that. Now, new geopolitical situation emerging. And of course, AI. So on the one hand, we know we need more new ideas than ever before. But on the other hand, the, the, the way that we're having public discourse and the dynamics behind this is, is actually blocking any real conversation. So as an expert in collective intelligence and really having delved into the need of thinking how we work differently together to come up with new ideas, um, what would you say are the biggest challenges and also the biggest opportunities um, in this uh, very strange landscape that we find ourselves in. Well, the internet is an incredible tool for the world to think together. <laughs> well, and we every day use things like Wikipedia, which is a, a collective intelligence tool. The whole world of science has been changed by citizen science projects where millions of people take part in, in, in observation or, or, or interpretation. And many businesses, as a matter of course, try to tap into the, the brain power of their consumers or their workers to using technology to solve problems. The issue is that although these are all happening, and to my mind are extremely healthy, they're relatively marginal, and they haven't really been embedded into the way our whole systems work. And you can see this paradox in relation to climate change, which you mentioned. The IPCC, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, invented in the late 80s, It is in a way an extraordinary global collective intelligence. It mobilizes thousands of scientists to share data and models and interpretations about where the climate is going. And online, you can share, you know, lots of information about how to maybe retrofit your home or how to advance battery technologies. But our systems for doing that really systematically to really tap into all of the different kinds of knowledge which we need to make the transition to a net zero society, that has hardly happened at all. It's fragmentary. And although vast sums have gone into AI in the last 10 or 20 years, whether in the military or in companies like, uh, like, uh, like Alphabet, 
Most of that money has either gone for things like guiding you know, drones and missiles or things like recommendation engines on YouTube or better ways to you know, order a pizza, not actually on solving our most, uh, our most crucial problems. And I think there are lots of really good examples of what this could mean in the future, what combinations of AI, collective intelligence and democracy could look like. And I'll just give one little example. Uh, there are many methods now where you can get thousands of people together to deliberate on on a question, which could be, you know, a future plan for your city or what needs to be done to care for the elderly. And AI can help a group see what other people are thinking, can give suggestions about information which might help them make decisions, can help guide a group towards consensus or collective problem solving rather than polarization. But these remain very, very marginal compared to the wall of money we will see being spent on democracy this year. But for campaigning adverts in the US or in India and elsewhere, almost none of which will actually inform people in any deep way about the choices they face, will often actually misinform them. And I would just love to see a little bit of that brain power, that cash, those resources going to actually improving democracy as a collective problem-solving technology, not just as a way for people to shout at each other in new media. You're also an expert in social innovation, having uh, led uh, the Young Foundation um, and worked a lot of this. How do you think these two concepts link together? So the need for social innovation to amplify collective intelligence? So for me, uh, I, I, I'm a professor in an engineering department, so I'm a lover of science and R&D and technology and tend to see these as quite benign forces in the world. But I think we have an imbalance. Many of our countries now spend 2 3 4% of GDP on research and development, which is fantastic for new, new aeroplanes or new nanotechnologies or new AI. But we're much worse at using R&D to solve social problems, to think about issues like homelessness, or care for the elderly, or how we change our everyday behavior patterns to, to, to reduce waste, let's say, or to cut our carbon emissions. And this is where social innovation comes in. I think it's useful both pragmatically to invest in social innovation, because otherwise your systems stagnate. They fail to advance. They become less effective and less productive. And again and again, we find it's the human, the social aspect of education or care or health, which is as important as the hardware and the technology. But I think it's also important for another reason, and that is to give people a feeling of agency. I think it's also really important and this is a much deeper issue, which really goes to the heart of democracy, is to give people a feeling of agency. That's what democracy promises, that you will have power. You will be able to shape and control the things which matter in your own life. And yet in many fields, people don't feel they have that agency. They think they're just passive observers on decisions made by others. And a society which really mobilized social innovation, so every neighborhood could be running experiments and tests and trying things out, would be one where people felt more in control of their lives, more in control of their, their futures. I think this is also an issue for science. There's very interesting research from around the world showing, although people trust science in many ways, they often don't think it benefits people like them. They're often not aware of the science done in their area or their city. And we're beginning to see these signs of alienation from a science system, which is often fantastic at, say, breakthroughs and new hardware and so, so on, but isn't actually answering the deep needs of people's daily lives, their needs for, for care, for love, for mental health, uh, and, and things of that kind. And that's why I would argue every society needs a pro-innovation, pro R&D stance, but it needs to be as much about the human, as much about the social, as it is about the physical stuff. Yeah, Jeff, and speaking about science, in your recent book, When Science Meet Power, uh, you referred to the dynamics between scientific understanding and political authority. Um, in this period, we see many things about that social uh, distrust of uh, science on, on, on one hand. Another uh, different use from power uh, that, 
uh, of science. Uh, how do you, and, and also, of course, the AI debate uh, with all the things that we need to think to do about AI and the process of democratic uh, use of AI. How do you judge the way we are regulating AI in this uh, domain and how uh, powers and democracies are dealing with science at present? Thanks, Luca. So I mentioned earlier that I think it's useful to think of democracy as a kind of assembly of multiple things. Now, some of those things, like a neighborhood making decisions about how to use the local park and so on, they don't involve very much science. It's quite easy, I think, to reimagine democracy at that ultra-local level. But more and more of the issues which certainly national governments are having to deal with involve a lot of quite complex science. We saw this through the, the pandemic as they had to understand infection rates and epidemiology. It's obviously true of climate change and understanding transitions of transport and energy systems. And it's certainly true of AI, where governments have to work out what to do, what laws to pass, what to regulate. And I think this is showing really quite a, a series of major problems on the relationship between democracy and politics on the one hand and science on the other. One part of this is this anti-science sentiment. You can see this very clearly in the US, it'll be very visible this year. Most Republican voters now don't trust scientists. They did 10 years ago, they don't now. And people like Ron DeSantis have tried to even outdo Donald Trump in their anti-science rhetoric. But that's only part of the story. I think there's also a bit of a problem with scientists themselves often struggling to understand what matters to the public, what things they should be accountable for. For example, very dangerous biohazard labs are situated in the middle of many big cities, but the public often is e even aware of this. And I think in many fields where science is very risky, we need new mechanisms of accountability, of democracy. But we also, crucially, need our politicians to better understand the science they're having to deal with. And AI has shown this very clearly. How few politicians have even the most basic training, the grasp of the issues, which can then guide them into passing wise laws, regulating in smart ways. So we've actually had AI as part of our daily life for 10, 15, 20 years in our phones, in probation systems, in health systems. It's only now politics is belatedly catching up with the need to, to block the worst uh, abuses of um, targeting or facial recognition and so on, or of, or of cyber at attacks, but also to amplify the potential good of AI in think, it feels like like education uh, and health. So what I argue in my new book is we actually need a, a, a reset, but on multiple levels. It's not just anti-science or pro-science. It's changing the character of science itself and its accountability to the public and really re reframing our, our, our politics, our political institutions, so they can do a better job of understanding these very complex issues. And just a final example, which is not that far off, is quantum computing. So many governments are investing enormous sums in quantum. It's very exciting. It's intellectually absolutely fascinating. But no one quite knows what quantum will do. It's possible some of the advances in quantum computing could destroy all of privacy on the internet, all of our WhatsApp and Gmails and so on. We don't know. It's possible it may uh, create wonderful ways of solving problems of things like transport coordination. But so far, not a single country has even got to first base in thinking through how should we have that dialogue? How should we think through the public interest as well as the commercial interest and the scientific fascination on this extremely uh, exciting but potentially very risky set of technologies? Thank you, Jeff. Um, in another book that you've written, Another World is Possible, How to Reignite Social and Political Imagination, and just let me tell you, I love that title, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of the ba basic concept behind a lot of, of my thinking. Um, you really give this dream view of what would be possible if we started thinking differently, if we dared to imagine uh, a different world. 
this year we're having you know a, a, a really a, an enormous year for democracy in the world we're having billions of people going to the ballot box uh, including in Europe in the US and in the UK what in your opinion would be the most important thing in order to tap into this energy and start daring to imagine um, a different reality so i fear this year of more more voting than ever before in human history will be quite a, a pessimistic year and in a way this was a prompt for me writing that book was the sense that political and social imagination had had shrunk had was stunted majorities in many countries expect life to, for, to be worse for their children than for them if you study the media or books you see this big shift from interest in progress and future to a focus on anxiety and risk and disaster and we can picture the dystopias much more easily than we can picture the utopias and i think this is a crucial challenge for democracy i think if you can't show people a plausible road map 10 20 30 years into the future about how life might get better then it's not surprising people either want to return to the past to some mythical golden age of the past or you just get into a sort of nasty negative politics where you look for scapegoats or someone uh, to blame so i fear 2024 will not be a year of fantastic progress. I think many of those elections will, in some ways, reinforce what we know is wrong with democracy than show it rather than showing the way forward. But what I hope we will get from political leaders is firstly, actually taking seriously their duty to help societies imagine. And I think we've overshot. I think we're much too pessimistic about the future. I think we're unrealistic in our fatalism and our pessimism. Politicians need to be part of that. But also in their programs, they need to be not just talking about the daily issues of, of, of jobs and migration and, and so on, but they also need to be fixing the system. Because as I said earlier, if our overall democratic system has failed to renew itself, failed to innovate, failed to reimagine itself, it's vital that we fix that as well as the problems of the present. Otherwise, this secular decline, this long-term decline of, of, of trust in democracy as a system will only get worse. So just to, to, to bring it a little bit... Uh back to our audience, uh, in one way we're saying that democracy has this enormous capacity because it, it's actually a system that it's built on the concept, as you were saying, it's, it's government of the people, of, of being able to take stock of all the experience and expertise out there. But the way we're handling it right now is maybe not the ideal way to be able to to, to take that and to, 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 to build that into the system. Do you think we need to have uh, um, a deeper revisiting of, of you know, the, the, the tripartite system of Montesquieu? Uh, do you think we need to reconsider how all these different parts work with particular focus maybe on the role of the fourth estate, so the, 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 the media and the, the, the media ecosystem? Yeah, I, I think democracy now is completely different from 300 years ago, not least because we have a state which is probably you know spending 40 or 50 percent of GDP. We have very large, complex state bureaucracies tied into democracy. So that's that means the sort of mental models of the 18th century or the 17th century really don't fit where we are today. And this is crucial for how we understand democracy as collective intelligence, because it means we're needing democracy to cope with multiple kinds of decision, some of which, as I said earlier, very relatively straightforward and accessible to people, like what to do in your neighborhood or and so on, but others incredibly complex and require deep, deep expertise, whether it's about science or as regulation of finance or planning of complex infrastructures. So the idea that democracy is just expression of the people's will is a very anachronistic idea. We should all want a democracy which knows the difference between a decision which I as an ordinary citizen can really contribute to and one where I'd be pretty stupid <laughs> if I if I was making, you know, uh, contributing to complex decisions. So it's that management of multiple kinds of expertise, really a repertoire of different kinds of decision is crucial. And this again is why democracy as assembly is so vital to understanding its future and how it makes the most of intelligence. And once you see it that way, 
then the boundaries of democracy are not just the boundaries of the parliament and the elections. They certainly include the fourth estate in all its meanings, the media, social media, all the different ways in which knowledge, information, judgment flow around. But they also include things like universities and science and uh, the deep repositories of knowledge and evidence, which sit again around the system, but which are vital to be drawn on if we're going to get good wise decisions in the public interest. I think this sort of should be obvious, but it sometimes gets missed out in, I think, the slightly simplistic framings of political theory, which are essentially, as I say, from the, the pre-modern era and don't really fit an incredibly sophisticated, complex society, which requires yeah, su subtle decision-making in so many different uh, spheres at the same time. And just to come with a last question, if, if I may, uh, we often talk about democracy in terms of national perspectives in a, in a very uh, national context, but we're moving in a more and more global world where the problems, as we saw with the pandemic, as we're seeing with many of things, cross the borders and you're seeing the need for more and more intergovernmental uh, collaboration, collaboration across, um, across countries and across continents as well. Uh, Guterres, so the Secretary General of the United Nations, has called for a summit for the future to revisit global governance. How do you think that fits with these broader topics about the re need to reimagine democracy and collective intelligence? Well, it's obvious that so many of the decisions we need and we do make in the world today don't fit within national borders. Um, but the world has struggled in reinventing democracy beyond the nation state. Europe is the the really the only major exception to that with the, the European Parliament. I've written quite a bit about what some of the reforms of global governance might look like, not trying to recreate a nation state at a global level where we all vote for a parliament and it has an army and a civil service and so on. I think that's, that's the wrong metaphor. Rather, what we need, again, it's a little bit like thinking of democracy as an assembly at a national level, we need multiple different ways of organizing things, many of which will be based on collective intelligence. And this is where the IPCC, the WHO, many other institutions are, I think, useful starting points because they try and organize global knowledge, global thinking, global data to support decision making at a global level without necessarily having an assembly with voting powers which can pass laws and raise taxes. That's the necessary first step. I've then also argued that there are many specific fields where we do need much stronger governance. AI is one which you've already mentioned. I've published various proposals on that uh, and on data. And here, one of the really interesting things is that when the UN was set up, an article was put into its constitution that it, every 10 years, it should rethink its structures. It should reimagine itself to ensure its processes and its structures fitted the tasks of the era. That hasn't been invoked since the 60s, <laughs> that clause. So the UN, in a weird way, has sort of been frozen now for half a century, even as the world around it has changed in so many different ways, above all with the rising importance of knowledge, data, information, digital, and so on, none of which have an expression in the UN system. So. I hope these exercises don't try and create a sort of mythical, as it were, nation state at a global level, which is what the sci-fi writers thought would happen 100 years ago. That, that's a dead end. But rather looking at multiple places where we can both create institutions which are democratic in spirit, accountable, transparent, and so on, but also which can pool global knowledge, experience of all kinds to guide how we collectively make decisions. So, uh, just uh, a, a, an in, uh, stupid question, but we in, in the West, we always think that democracy is the best system. Uh, how do, would you demonstrate that to somebody that is not a Western? So, in the past, it was often thought that democracy was a purely Western idea and couldn't spread to other cultures. Uh, we know that's not true at all. We know that some of the best democratic innovations are happening in countries like Taiwan. Uh, India is very much a democracy. Uh, and that, I think, 
that traditional view doesn't hold water at all now. We also, again, nowadays hear the argument which was often made in the 1930s that autocracies are more efficient than democracy. They make decisions much quicker. They can solve problems and so on. And again, that's an argument which doesn't really fit the facts. Almost always when a big democracy has fought a big autocracy, the democracy has won. They have dramatically bigger achievements in terms of economic growth, human well-being, health and so on than the autocracies. But I think it's very important Democrats are not complacent about that because I think these will only remain true so long as democracies can reinvent themselves, can innovate, can transform their own systems. If democracy stagnates, then it probably will decline relative to non-democracies. Uh, and China in particular, which is revolutionizing its governance, its use of technologies in all sorts of ways, is, in a, is the challenge to democracy. So my, my core argument to anyone would be a truly intelligent society is one which makes the most of all the collective intelligence available to it. And autocracies are usually bad at that because they crush some of the knowledge, some of the intelligence, which is threatening to the leaders. That's why they're, they're often very bad in pandemics because they deny they're, they're happening. It's why they're very bad at coping with discomforting data. And to me, the core of the, really the ethos of democracy is a willingness to engage with uncomfortable facts, uncomfortable ideas. That's what drives progress in the long run. And that's why a reinvented democracy, I'm sure, will always outperform uh, autocracy. So you would say that democracy is not an ethical uh, thing, it's an epistemological I think it's all of that. Democracy has an ethical core, an epistemological core, and a pragmatic core that over history, democracy has turned out to be the best, the most effective means of governance anyone's ever invented. But that doesn't mean it's perfect, and it certainly doesn't mean it doesn't deserve to be reimagined and reinvented periodically. Thank you very much, Jeff. And what a perfect way to end this fascinating conversation. I know we can talk about this for hours, but I think this gives our listeners an initial view of why it's so important to reimagine democracy, why we shouldn't be complacent. And I think that this is a very important element and to, you know, start believing in, you know, what we would be capable of doing if we thought about things differently and if we started trusting each other, maybe not only at a, at a national level, but also at a global level. I think we need to imagine this other world that you're talking about, that another world is possible um, so that we can, can, can hopefully imagine something more positive after 2024. Thank you very much, Jeff, for being here with us today and for delving into these very important and timely topics with us. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Luca.